Good evening, everyone. We have a fabulous lineup for you, some great guests tonight. And they tell you everything you need to know about why you can't miss at the virtual table and you can't miss reading the Chicago Sun-Times. We have a special offer to offer you tonight just for at the virtual table viewers. We've amped up our digital offer offerings to bring the Sun-Times to you wherever you are. You can, you must get the Sun-Times e-paper. It's a daily digital replica of the print product that lives at paper.suntimes.com. You can get it with a special digital offer that gives you unlimited access to both the e-paper and every story at suntimes.com for only $2.49 a month. Special offer only for at the virtual table fans, $2.49 a month. You can learn more and subscribe right now after the show. Not, not right now, but after the show at suntimes.com slash subscribe. Suntimes.com slash subscribe. Please be sure to stay informed with our essential coronavirus coverage and our top political coverage and continue and consider uh, subscribing to our podcast at the URLs on your screen. And now I'd like to introduce my co-host, the intrepid Washington Bureau Chief of, for the Chicago Sun-Times, Lynn Sweet. Hey, Lynn. Thank you, Laura. And hello, everybody. Hello on this eighth night, ninth, this eighth night of Hanukkah and a week before Christmas Eve. We've got a lot going on tonight. Let me just introduce who our guests, and then we'll break them up into segments. We'll have, and we're going to start with the last. We're going to talk about Michael Madigan, what happens to him with state representatives, one Republican, Tom Demmer, one Democrat, Stephanie Kefferwit. We're going to, we are hoping to have Professor Michael Eric Dyson with us. Uh, he's hopefully will be joining us at some point in the show, but we're going to start now with <laughs> two great Democrats who have run statewide, Illinois Attorney General Karami Ruff. Kwame, I cannot talk tonight, everybody. Illinois Attorney General Kwame Raul and Illinois Comptroller Susanna Mendoza. So we are talking to you mainly about the Biden transition right now. So I want to start with you, Mr. Attorney General. You have been on the front lines of a coalition of Democratic attorney generals who have just been fighting the Trump administration and these multi-state lawsuits. What's it going to be like? Do you and your other Democratic attorney generals plan on playing offense to go to defense now? Well, it, it, thanks for the question and good evening and good evening to you and your audience. Um, it depends on the issue. Um, the While uh, we've been, as you indicated, we've been active during the Trump administration, um, you know, challenging some of, uh, of the president <laughs> and, and some of the agency's policies. Uh, certainly during my two years and prior to my two years, Lisa Madigan uh, uh, collaborated with uh, colleagues from throughout the country. Before Trump's administration, we were active as well because some of the Republican uh, attorneys general used their uh, bully pulpits as well as their uh, capacity to, to sue and to write amicus briefs to challenge some of the Obama administration's policies. And so I anticipate that will happen during the Biden administration as well. It should be noted, though, that, you know, not all multi-state actions are of a partisan nature. There are many that are, are, are bipartisan in nature. And so uh, there has been bipartisan efforts to, to send messages either to Congress or or to some of the, the federal agencies as well. As an example of that, that Google lawsuit that is moving today? Yeah, and that's in several parts because you know uh, we we are part of a bipartisan coalition that uh, have, have filed a lawsuit, antitrust lawsuit, uh, based on the search engine um, practices of Google. There was yesterday there was a Texas-led uh, uh, coalition that was strictly Republican uh, AGs uh, that that filed a, a lawsuit against Google based on the advertisement technology. Uh, so there, there may be con consolidation of that in the federal government's action 
in the future. But as of right now, I'm part of the bipartisan coalition that filed today. But, and Madam Controller, I'll get to you in a minute. But just talk about the politics of this, Kwame. You have been, these attorney generals have been highly partisan right now. Look at this Texas lawsuit. You had what, 18 or 19 Republicans who signed on, Republican attorney generals who signed on to an attempt to overthrow the election result. How well, hard? That was un that was unconscionable. That, you know, I, I, I you know. And these uh, are the guys you want to work with? Well, some of them, some of them I've developed relationships with and, and, and we can't ignore the politics behind the scenes that probably led to the decision making for some of them to join that lawsuit, notwithstanding their better knowledge of the law, given all of the decisions that had been made at a, in state courts, in federal court, and in the Supreme Court for that matter. These decisions had, uh, uh, with regards to the integrity of these elections had already been made and, and decided it. And some of the actions were, they were challenging, were actions uh, taking place where the, the, the pre presider over, uh, like you take Georgia, for example, the Secretary of State is a Republican sec Secretary of State. And so um, it's unfortunate that they signed on to those lawsuits. It's unfortunate that members of uh, Congress were, had their arms twisted to, 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 to sign on to that lawsuit because it had no basis in fact or law. Well, you know, Attorney General, the, the, you make, the, the problem here, though, is that you point out there's politics involved, and they're not, there shouldn't be politics should. involved in your work, in the work of your colleagues. So, so why, why is that? And, and, it, and it, when the shoe is on the other foot, can we expect to see some political decisions being made on your side as we go forward with, into the Biden administration? No, I mean, it, it, there's certainly policies that are, are more common for Democrats to embrace because they're consistent with, you know, access to education and access to healthcare, which are tenets of being a, a, a Democrat. But that, that's different from just being purely political, doing something because you're a Democrat or doing something because you, you're a Republican because you don't want to stray from um, what your party is doing. Well, it wasn't, um, it really wasn't just about what your party was doing, it was about protecting the president or, 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 or appearing to, to, to want to side with the president, because even though it was very clear that the law was not on his side. Wouldn't you say that? that, that yeah, I, I agree with that. And I would even go further to say it's, and some of it was about self-preservation or other self-interest. I won't go to, into too much details about the- No, what, please. What the, <laughs> what, what the Texas Attorney about... General- <laughs> The, the ability of Trump to maybe cut these guys off on their legs. So, so let me ask you this. Uh, by the way, happy anniversary, Susanna Mendoza. Ah, uh, thank you. What year is this for you? Do you um do you dig my perfectly positioned photo of my hubby and I back there? The um, young bride. How many? Yeah, years? it's our ninth ninth anniversary, and uh, I'm so glad it's the ninth and not the tenth because ten is my favorite next? number. Mm -hmm. And next year, hopefully for the tenth, we will be back to somewhat normal and can actually go out for dinner or go someplace special for an anniversary. Well, yeah, yeah, Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. <laughs> but he's awesome because he was totally cool about me doing this tonight when we really should be eating. But it's all great. I love being with you. Everybody out there, is there no better way to spend your anniversary, your birthday, or that special occasion than at the virtual table at the Chicago <laughs> Times? And I endorse it. Dessert, you will Every nap is not for us, but you'll hear again. And for a dessert or the perfect holiday gift, it will be a subscription to the Chicago Sun Times. That's a right. birthday, an anniversary for that special. Cheers to that. <laughs> Lynn never misses an opportunity to sell, sell, sell. Seamless, <laughs> and I love it. Yes. Anyway, anyway, Susanna, I want to follow up on what Mommy was saying about uh, the self interest of the Republicans, who I guess were afraid of who knows what from Trump. What is going to happen in the days ahead because we have these election deniers. What happens to our nation? Well, it's it's really sad. I mean, I feel like, um, first of all, hi to everybody. Um, but I think that what we're seeing here with the attorney generals that to me is so disconcerting is that it's not based on like an issue, like for example, healthcare or education. It's specifically around an election, which by definition is purely political and an election that everyone has essentially any legitimate entity has uh, more than validated has gone for president-elect 
Joe Biden. And it's it's really like it's a temper tantrum that instead of squashing it, they've, uh, you know, joined into it. I mean, my eight year old knows that if he loses at a board game in the house, he can't cry about it for all eternity. He certainly maybe cries a little bit. We give him a timeout and he's over it. He hasn't been crying about losing at Monopoly since November 7th, right? So it's really terrible. If it were just that, we could laugh about it. But the fact of the matter is that taking these legal actions uh, that are so wrong morally, frankly, and it, it they pose a real threat to democracy. And, and this is going to have lasting ramifications for many years and potential administrations down the road, including our ability to get to work quickly in the middle of a global pandemic that has already killed 300,000 plus people. And um, so many people are fighting for their lives. My brother being one of them, who's day 34 today in the hospital, um, fighting for his life from COVID-19 as a Chicago police officer. So I take this very personally, both on the um, you know personal side, but also as controller, You know, because every time I have to pay a bill for something like body bags, it makes it very real for me. And this should not be about politics. It should about, be about respecting the will of the people who we all know voted overwhelmingly. I mean, you have, what is it now? 8 million votes more for President-elect Biden. He won the popular vote and the electoral. So let's just get to work. I mean, we shouldn't be playing these stupid games and people's lives are literally on the line and you know, not conceding, not affording a, a really great transition when we need it most is putting American lives at risk and it's imperiling uh, the fiscal futures of every single state in this country. Now, Comptroller, how, how, can, how, can, how would you say this has impacted, I mean, your job in terms of your ability, you mentioned the body bags. What is, what is going on, what is happening with our, our state spending, with our budget as a result of this kind of foot dragging as a result of this not facing up to reality here? Yeah, sure. I mean, Laura, everyone knows that Illinois has had many years of fiscal uh, mismanagement. That's Nothing both, new. Yeah, Democrats and Republicans. If we're being fair, we should say that that's across the board. Democrats and Republicans have done a poor job of managing the state's finances. I will say that I walked into a nightmare that most people wouldn't have wanted the job of controller when I first ran and got elected. I inherited a gigantic bill backlog. Um, I've done my very best to, to chip away at that bill backlog. I took it from what, almost 17 billion down to about 6 billion when we had our last state of the budget, when we thought we were finally getting out of the woods and then boom, COVID-19 hits. So COVID-19, independent of whatever self-inflicted wounds Illinois had given itself in years past, because we have that, right? That bill backlog, which I was working on paying down and was doing a great job. But when COVID-19 hit, it, threw, it blew a crater, not a hole, but a crater into our revenues. Obviously, the state went into lockdown, as many states across the country did. So this is not just an issue that impacted Illinois' finances, but all 50 states. Blue states, red states, you name it, they all would like to see, if we're being honest, uh, fiscal relief come from Washington, not for the mistakes of the past in Illinois, and I've been very clear about that. I don't think that the federal government has an obligation to pay our pension debt or any of that stuff, but they do. It is the role of the federal government to step up and help states like Illinois and every single other state, including Kentucky, um, get past this COVID-19 specific hole in our budgets, which in our case could be five or six billion dollars at least. And you know, we've already seen over the same time period this year versus last year, over two billion dollars in less revenue coming into the state because people aren't working, they're not eating out at restaurants, you know, they are unemployed, um, and it's, it's been very, very difficult. That money has to come from somewhere, and by delaying paying uh, stimulus or financial help to all 50 states, not just Illinois, because they're all in the same boat when it comes to COVID uh, relief and the need for that, by delaying this, by playing politics with this, all they're doing is making every state have to make tougher decisions that are hurting the very people that we're trying to help. In Illinois, we've had to borrow billions of dollars right. just to, to get through the gap, right? Where if they gave us that money from the get-go, because I think we'll see it maybe a few months from now, you know, why make us have to pay interest on loans that we're borrowing from the federal government? It, it's self-defeating and it's it's just not fiscally smart. So we're doing the best we can with tough circumstances. Yes, Lynn, I'm sorry. The real world politics right now, city and state, uh, relief is not in the bill. 
So right. We heard you, but let me ask you this, with the Biden administration coming in, unlike in the Obama White House, where you had you know, a lot of Illinoisans joining it, uh, most of the cabinet spots are being filled. Are, when we look at the regional posts that are so important, are you, you or Kwame pushing anyone for the regional uh, HUD, EPA, uh, you know, these, these spots that are on the ground closer to what Illinois might be actually uh, doing? Well, I mean, I think that we have a great opportunity with Pete Buttigieg getting the transportation uh, secretary position. I mean, he's the closest thing that we have to a local here in Illinois. I mean, you just heard that. I thought it was cute that he proposed to Chaston at O'Hare Airport, but the guy is incredibly he intelligent. He was an intern uh, at, uh, for Renee Ferguson. And then right, at, at NBC5. Right, Illinois, that's right. And so he understands Chicago. He's He's, and his so, campaign headquarters had its uh, branch office on the South Loop. Yeah, so I mean, I think that the president is going to, I'm very pleased with the cabinet that he's put together, which is the most diverse, I think incredibly qualified uh, group of men and women who frankly look like America. It's been super heartening to me to see that. And I think that, you know, I love the pick of Javier Becerra for uh, Health and Human Services. Um, you know, he has a, a track record as an attorney general of fighting for protections for people's health care. It's exactly what we need right now, uh, given COVID-19 and the pandemic that we're going through. And so I think that, you know, more so than like, who do I know that could get a position? I just want to make sure that the, the cabinet that the president is picking is one that's reflective of what our country looks like and has a level of expertise and diverse, not just what they look like, but they're diverse of thought. Uh, and that's how we're going to move this country forward. But I, I really hope that over the next month, you know, when we get to January 20th, whatever these political games are that are frankly hurting our country and the future of our country and our standing in the world are put aside and we all act like adults and move the country forward. Because this is not about blue states. It's not about red states. Right. Illinois, just to be clear too here with Mitch McConnell always pun trying to punch us in the face. I mean, like, hey, he should say thank you. Because frankly, because of states like Illinois and Connecticut uh, and New Jersey and New York is that states like Kentucky, his home state, can pretend that they're fiscally stable when in fact they would go bankrupt if it weren't for the donor states like Illinois that have been keeping them afloat. So, you know, this is about coming together. We're not saying we don't want to help Kentucky as a donor state. What I'm saying is that Kentucky of all states should be saying that they understand the need to send federal relief to all 50 states it's about the American people, not about, you know, Republicans or Democrats. Okay, I, Susanna, that's, I want to pause you there and, and just uh, let, let our viewers know that Michael Eric Dyson has joined us. Thank you, Michael. We're going to be talking about this whole issue of diversity in, in Biden's cabinet in a minute. But before we leave you and, and uh, Kwame Raul, I'd like to come back to Kwame and, 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 mm -hmm. and raise a, a very important, very local issue that has been hot in the news this week, and that is this uh, mistaken police raid on a, at the home of a, of a, of a woman's of an African American woman social worker, Anjanette Young, which we're all familiar with, especially here in Chicago, it was a terrible, terrible thing. There's a video of it. Uh, the mayor is 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 uh, had, had been forced to apologize over this. It happened didn't happen under her watch. It happened under the previous mayor in terms of the police department conduct. But I want to bring this to you. Kwame Raul, because as you know, your predecessor, Lisa Madigan, was very in, involved and very, uh, it, it was a, played a very important role in bringing the consent decree, police reform consent decree that, that, that Chicago is now under, which is supposed to change, supposed to stop these kinds of behavior, this kind of uh, activity. Yeah. So I'd like to get you, I get, where do we stand with the consent decree? decree and, so how, and, what, and what do you, what do you say to, to voters who say, how can we get this court order now? Well, how, why is this kind of thing still happening? Well, the in, important thing to note about the consent decree, uh, the entry of the consent decree didn't mean that the in, that all problems are solved. The 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 the, the most in, important three words uh, in Judge Dow's order entering the consent decree was "let the last three let us begin." That sent so many signals that this is going to be a long process. For anybody believes that who believes that the entry of the consent decree means all is well and uh, the Chicago Police Department's practices are going to be uh, reformed day one of the entry of the consent. We have been engaged in an ongoing process. Our involvement didn't stop with with bringing on the consent decree. Uh, 
I just I penned a letter back in September addressing this very issue of wrong rates, um, encouraging the Chicago Police Department to to end no, the no knock uh, warrant uh, policies and and to develop policies to 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 make sure to the best degree possible that wrong rates don't occur. We saw what happened in Kentucky with Breonna Taylor. That was a wrong raid. Uh, that you know the 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 issue that has hit the news this week with regards to the, the is not the first um, sure. it's, uh, it's, uh, in here in, in Chicago. Absolutely. I, you know, I, uh, CBS who cover, uh, that, that covered the story did file a, a FOIA for the release of, of um, the, the, the video. There is a provision in, in the law that allows for an expect, protection of an expectation of privacy for the victim of that wrong wrong raid, and so when it came, it was risen to our office. We did say, um, based on the, uh, CBS not having at that point a consent from the the victim of that wrong raid, you know, we had to uphold the city's decision not to release. But we advised them to go get the the right. consent. But that what that looked like though is to, to the average uh, person is a, a cover up that you that you were just just like the cover up that happened under the Kwame McDonald case with that video. I know the cases are different, but how do you explain that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, FOIA, uh, FOIA exemptions should not be used as a tool to to cover up. Uh, certainly, if there's sensitive uh, information uh, that 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 can compromise an ongoing investigation. Um, that exemption should be used, but it shouldn't be used just because we have a bad PR situation that we don't we don't we don't want exposed. And and we send that signal to 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 municipalities as as we advise them, and and, and we make certain that we we do that balancing act when things are are uh, uh, appealed up to our uh, public access office. And so um, in this situation, uh, you know, it's unconscionable. Um, and and um, that's why you know before this week, you know several months ago, we we wrote a letter uh, to to CPD uh, along with a coalition which uh, 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 who are members in the party to the consent decree action that is ongoing uh, to to address this very issue of wrong raids and no not warrants. Well, we'll have to see where that takes us. There's going to be a lot more investigations and, and questions to come. Lynn, I'll toss it back to you for our, to, to bring in our next guest. Okay, and thank you, uh, Susanna Mendoza and Kwame Raul. Joining us now is Michael Eric Dyson. Michael, welcome to At the Virtual Table. Thank Michael you. Eric Dyson, as I'm sure so many of our viewers know, is a sociologist, a Baptist minister, an author, a university professor with Chicago Roots, after the first of the year, he'll be moving from Georgetown University to Vanderbilt, where he will be the professor of African American and Diaspora Studies. He writes a lot of books. His latest is Long Time Coming, Reckoning with Race in America. And we in Chicago, of course, got to know you, Michael, when you were teaching at the Chicago, at the Chicago Theological Society and at DePaul. So you're coming at us. And the reason I wanted you on the show, Laura and I wanted you here, is that one of the things Joe Biden is doing now is making his appointments. The news of the day is, is that uh, he's going to tap Deb Callen to be the Interior Secretary. If confirmed, she'll be the first Native American. He's also likely to pick Michael Reagan as the first EPA chief. If confirmed, he'll be the first Black person to head the EPA. So what is your assessment right now and how Biden is doing to, to make good on his pledge of diversity? Well, Lynn and Laura, thank you so much for, for having me on. Uh, great conversation. Yeah, I mean, he's doing a great job. <laughs> I mean, um, the the diversity, uh, I think as uh, uh, Ms. Mendoza was saying, the diversity of thought, opinion, approach, ideology, politics, race, um, gender orientation, sexual orientation, uh, it's beautiful. It's been more diverse than I've seen a whole bunch of other presidents. I can't remember one. Uh, that pulled together uh, this many different kinds of forces, highly intelligent, highly gifted. You know, people think there has to be a playoff against, you know, either you're talking diversity on one hand or quality on another. 
the Trump administration should disabuse us forever that white men automatically symbolize competence, right? If anything, the deconstruction of mediocrity uh, in lethal, pernicious mediocrity. Uh, so we should never again assume, well, it's a person of color. Oh, it's a woman. Is she qualified? Are you asking that question when we have just seen uh, the panoply of figures who have had no reason to be where they are, whether they're a neurosurgeon trying to hit HUD or, you know, some guy who you know, goes from a corporate America to become the secretary of state. But what Joe Biden has done, he's been at this a long time. He's, he's been thinking about this quite a long time, his third time uh, at bat. And he finally uh, hits a home run. He's now the president. And he has chosen, I think, carefully, judiciously, and wisely uh, the people in his cabinet who will inform him, who will carry out policy, who will set uh, standards, who will create benchmarks. And uh, I think it, you know, the fact that he stood up and said, Black America, you had my back and now I've got yours, you know, situates himself in public space with an accountability metric uh, that he was willing and boldly willing to articulate so I think so far so good. So Michael, you are you are satisfied? You're you're comfortable with the the, the, the diversity because there's been been a number of African American groups, the NAACP, Urban League, who have spoken out. Now that wasn't today; it was last week, but have spoken out with some concern about where he was, where, where Biden was headed with his diversity picks. You're you're well, satisfied? You think? I mean, he's I'm just saying. Look. He said he hasn't chosen the Department of Justice. He hasn't chosen the Attorney General, but he's got you know a black man in defense, Michael Reagan. You got Marsha Fudge. I mean, he's got more than Obama. So the people who were disappointed, you know, who were satisfied with Obama because Obama's blackness itself constituted an advantage to many people, without thinking. You know, he can't be the only black guy in the room or the, the, the one who will carry, he's obviously gonna be the major one. But it's interesting to me, if the, why does the metric shift when you got a white guy in office who's choosing more diversity than the black guy who was there and you were satisfied with that? I'm, I, I think that the NAACP, the National Urban League should do their job. They should press, they should push, they should hold accountable. Um, in a way that they didn't do with Obama, that they certainly uh, didn't do, uh, couldn't do with Donald Trump. So I think given that, uh, Joe Biden will be asked to step up to the plate in a way that these same leaders didn't press Obama in public, yeah, didn't hold him accountable in public the same way, uh, mm -hmm. are holding him accountable. And he's not, offend you know, he's not offended by that. He should be held accountable. Uh, just because we didn't do it with them didn't mean we, should, we shouldn't do it with him. We should, but I think so far, given the man an opportunity and chance to do what he's doing, he's got, you know, he's got a gay man, an explicitly gay man, LGBTQ, right? Uh, that He's got the first native person. Yes, you have to have a diversity of diversity in mm -hmm. terms of constituting what this quote American society looks like. So yeah, I think uh, so far so good. Okay, so on this attorney general pick, the two front runners right now, according to CNN are Doug Jones, a uh, defeated uh, senator who will be out of office, and Merrick Garland, who raised in Lincolnwood, Nile, Niles West graduate, who was uh, just screwed over by the Republicans when Obama tapped him for attorney, right. excuse me, for the Supreme Court. Right. Nonetheless, as much as it's great to look for a native Illinoisan to be in the cabinet, there is talk among some of the civil rights leaders and others that this is a position, given the time of racial reckoning that we're in, Michael, that you should pick a black person to lead the Justice Department. What do you think? I agree. I mean, um, you know, given the issues at stake, given the fact that there's been a, a rampant decimation of the infrastructure of the Justice Department, it has become a footstool uh, for the President of the United States of America. Basically, uh, a parlor politics with his own existential anxiety being channeled through um, the attorney general, making him a foot soldier in his, you know, campaign against truth and democracy. So, you know, William Barr is no hero. And so for people going, oh my God, he's now retiring. He's probably got the, you know, a, a, a pardon in his back pocket. 
and the guarantee that he's going to be spared, uh, they have been a travesty. And so to restore uh, dignity to that office in a way that, you know, you had last, um, you know, after Eric Holder, and then you had um, what, uh, the attorney general. Loretta Lynch. Uh, I'm sorry. Loretta Lynch. Right, Loretta Lynch. You're talking about. And, you know, Loretta Lynch wasn't as aggressive about those police um you know uh, well she did it was under loretta lynch that the uh police uh, oh that the chicago police uh deal was made right but that was our the stuff that was in, was in the works okay. she got into office let me move okay. you to the present who are Don't the names name me some names of people you would like to see biden think about for attorney general michael I mean, you know, Barack Obama. Okay, I know he's not going. <laughs> no, uh, he's busy. <laughs> yeah, his wife has got him on, uh, you know, potty training for, you know, better husbandry in uh, his own life. So I dig that. But, you know, think, I think Deval Patrick would be an interesting choice if you want to go Chicago as well, right, with local roots there. Um, I think that Sally Yates has an understanding and conscientiousness about the issue of race that is serious. So it's not a one-to-one -one correlation. We got we got my man on the bench there, uh, Clarence Thomas, and just having a black face in a high place doesn't make a difference if you don't have the right kind of consciousness and conscientiousness. So I think Sally Yates or, or Deval Patrick would be two good picks uh, to think seriously and critically about it, leading the nation's efforts to try to restore dignity and decency to that office, but also a bit of independence, right? so that you're not the yes man of the president of the United States of America, and you've got to deal with those consent decrees. You've got to talk about the degree to which these police departments have to be held accountable. And if you're disinclined to speak about defunding the police, as if, and this is where I would argue with the former President Obama too, although I get his point. I, as a leftist and progressive, we're not exempt from understanding marketing. And if you're going to say something, do you want the commercial or the product? Right. You're talking about just so everyone is in on what we're talking oh, about. I believe, Michael, you're talking about where Barack Obama. Right. Said we ought to lay off this defund the police slogan because right. it's killing us in, in the right. poll. And yeah. by the way, yeah. Biden said that when he had this leaked meeting with civil rights right. leaders last week and I listened to it, he right. basically said the same thing. Like, can you figure out another way to explain what you're doing? Because but, we have the Georgia Senate election. Right. I'm down with that. Look, I'm down with practicality yeah. and strategy. But here's the point. Yeah. Obama's a real one of the smartest political guys in the world. But if you're if you're angrier at the people using the term than why they have to use the term, you're really undercutting the moral legitimacy of a viewpoint that says, bruh, are you more mad at people using defund the police than cops killing black people? And where is it? Why is it that the the you know, that the, the vast majority of your angst is directed at those people who deploy the term. Because are you telling me really that, oh, yes, let's call it uh, reimagining policing? That I, well, this is that's what he did. 21st century police task force is what the uh, yada, yada, yada. And I tell you so what, let me, let me move there's, no, a little there's bit. no possibility of reforming the police. They've tried that already. We've at least got to try something different. Lynn, Lynn, I'd love to, I'd love to get Kwame Raul's uh, perspective on this. Uh, what do you think about Michael's point that there needs to be an African American, or preferably an African American, in that Attorney General slot? And 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 what what names would you suggest for that for that role? Well, I I don't know that I'm prepared to give spe uh, specific names, but I I, I will uh, grab onto his his one of his second points that the black face alone uh, doesn't mean that you have the policies that that matter most. You mentioned Clarence Thomas, uh, uh, Ben Carson. Uh, there are a number of people I can name that who would, would not embrace the type of policies that we need right now. I think we need to uh, look, as much as we're looking at the cabinet positions, we need to look a layer down as well. I just got just today appointed as a co-chair of the uh, uh, NAGS Committee on Civil Rights. So we're watching this uh, very carefully. And, and we made sure as attorneys general, as the Democrat attorneys general in the George Floyd uh, Justice and Policing Act that it was amended to give state attorneys general uh, the power to do patterns and practice investigations, the kind of which that uh, Jeff Sessions and Barr were not doing and Loretta Lynch and, and, and mm -hmm. uh, Eric Holder did do and, and AGs before them and even Good under God. Bush. 
So again, so uh, there's no, when you mentioned NAG, that's Nas National Association of Attorney General. Attorneys General. And it's yeah, so, the National Association of Aspiring Governors. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Okay, so, so I want to uh, then. So, but I, one last point. So, yes. so we have, as we look at the, 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 the cabinet positions, you have to look a layer down too. So like Deputy AG of Civil Rights they're going to be getting their hands yes. a lot more dirty than the AG themselves sure. on some of these issues. Okay, big question, Michael Dyson. Do you think then that Joe Biden can and will be bolder when it comes to these issues of race, racial reckoning, addressing the big issues of the day that, of this period that we're in right now? Do you think Joe Biden will be more bold than Barack Obama? Well, of course, and he has the right, he has the privilege to do so, right? Because uh, white privilege in the sense that he's not held to account because he's the black president. Oh my God, you feel kind of anxious because of the fact that people are now all eyes on me and they're looking at me, which I understand Barack Obama had, right? So in that sense, the privilege that Joe Biden has is not to carry that burden, but also to have some ideas about how better uh, to match the situations and crises we confront with people who can address them and with his centrist um, kind of politics with Jim Clyburn in one ear and Cedric Richmond in the other, trying to figure out how to negotiate this stuff uh, in, in good fashion, but also pay attention to AOC, pay attention to the progressive wing of the party and figure out ways to address these issues. But to, in a word, yes, I think, Joe, and let me tell you what, Joe Biden is just, and, and people underplay this, is a decent human being. And being a decent human being makes a difference to have both empathy, the empathy that drives policy decisions, or at least to embrace certain policy decisions. And when you make tough decisions, to have the consideration of the people over whose lives those decisions will exercise some influence uh, is extremely important. And him being one of the nicest guys that's been there for a while and his inclination to also reach across the aisle, reach across within your own party as well, as opposed to also reaching across uh, the aisle for those who are in the uh, Republican Party. But yes, I think he will be inclined to do something well and good and powerful. I think that Vice President Harris being there is going to be a boon as well. And I think that uh, what what uh, Reverend Dr. Kwame uh, talked about there uh, in terms of the, the bench, let's again, Obama, you got to situate a bench. You got to make the pipeline full of people. And he wasn't inclined to do that. Because if he was inclined to do that, even the birtherism attacks and the virulent racism that Obama confronted, if he had been more strategic and conscientious, which is why I'm a little bit tougher on him about spare me your, your discourse about uh, the language deployed for uh, defunding the police when you ain't mad at the people, black people who are getting killed and died, I just show some anger about that, bruh. So the point is you didn't, when you were president, build a pipeline that could have had many, many more black people in place to become eligible, to be elevated because they were in those subordinate positions. So there are many strategies that need to be deployed. And I think quite frankly, Joe Biden has more of a feel growing up with black folk in Delaware and feeling them intimately than many other presidents. And I think it'll be used to our advantage. Well, before we wrap up this, seg this segment and we go to state politics, I want to just ask you, Michael, then do you think that Biden, given everything, should appoint a racial equity uh, advisor. You know that NAACP was pressing him to, you know, carve out that very special kind of a job. What do you think? I think it would have been great. It would have been great to have oh, it. Not too late. He still could do it. Oh yeah, that's what I'm yeah. saying. I'm saying it would be great for him to do that. Uh, we should have had one two two administrations ago, three administrations ago. We should have had one the last administration. But the point is, yes, because. You know, again, the burden that, say, a guy like Obama carried, look, you're doing all this other stuff. It would have been great to have somebody in that lane responsible for that so that you could be relieved to do other kind of stuff but exercise your executive authority. But I think absolutely to pay attention to this, to show that it's serious. If you elevate FEMA to a cabinet level position because you think emergency management on a federal level is critical, then elevate that to a kind of cabinet position or something, a, a race czar who can speak yeah. to these issues in more nuanced and complicated fashion. I think it would be beautiful. Okay, and Michael, just your point is we have one on climate now, climate czar, so we'll see. Thank you for joining us. Hope to have you back on the show. It's yeah, been great. 
a uh, happy new happy holidays happy new year to you we're signing off with michael eric dyson and thank you michael we'll throw it to cool. laura to bring us into state politics and what's going to happen with mike madigan laura take it away well Thanks. and mike mike madigan lynn you those are the two words that are on the lips of everyone working in, in state politics right now and we have two very key people who've been right in the mix with us Representative Tom Demmer, who is a ranking Republican, was a ranking Republican on the Mike Madigan investigative panel. It's, 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 it's just wrapping up. And State Representative St Stephanie Kiffelwood, who is the first and only, remains the first and only uh, uh, legislator who has dared to suggest that she might challenge uh, uh, Mike Madigan for House speakership. So I, I want to, Tom Demmer, I want to start with you in terms of what happened this week. There were some fireworks around that investigative panel and maybe some. Uh, some leftover sore, sore feelings because of it. But what's your perspective on, on how that went and, and how that impacts where, where we're headed next month for the, for the uh, coming election of perhaps a new speaker? Yeah, well, first, thanks, uh, Lynn and Laura, for having me on this evening. I think this is an important conversation for people uh, in both political parties, really across the state of Illinois, talking about the longest serving speaker of, how, of the House in, in U.S. history. What we saw this week in the Special Investigative Committee uh, was, I think, uh, an abdication of responsibility. The Special Investigative Committee was put together at the end of August with the exclusive duty to conduct a thorough investigation, uh, largely in response to the federal court filings we've seen that have implicated Speaker Madigan in a long-running uh, scheme of, of uh, rewarding and influencing public officials. Uh, the committee, though, in 106 days, only met three times and only heard from one witness. And it's hard to say after a, an experience like that, that we conducted a thorough investigation. Uh, we made motions to use the committee's power of subpoena to bring in Mike Madigan, to bring in Mike McLean and Pramajor, individuals who have been indicted by uh, in federal court for these actions. In the uh, comment, that's how in you the can, comment investigation you're talking that's about. Right. Yeah. That's right, that's right. And you know, that's how you, uh, our, our duty as a committee was to investigate under the House rules as a member of the House of Representatives. That's how you conduct a real investigation. And that's not at all what we saw happen uh, when a, a, a vote was taken on Monday to hear from no additional witnesses and then to immediately shut down the investigation and go no further. And so you, and so you, you feel that you did, there, there was, or there, was there anything new you learned from that one witness from, from some, there was a lot of work that was being done behind the scenes as well. Did you learn anything new that's, that's uh, re relevant to what people should expect uh, in terms of the election next month? Well, I think we did hear, hear quite a bit. You know, Con, Con Ed came and testified for several hours at the one hearing we did uh, have a witness at. They also produced some documents and it shows that, uh, you know, time and time and time again, there are direct references to the speaker making requests him following up on requests, um, and also some, you know, not so subtle uh, threats that if we don't grant this favor that he's going to ask for more, or he's going to be highly irritated. Uh, I think it tells people as they consider who they're going to vote for, for Speaker of the House in the upcoming General Assembly, uh, you have to ask yourself, is that the kind of person you want uh, at the helm? Is that the kind of leadership culture that you want to continue after we've seen the way that it's, uh, it really has failed the people of Illinois for years? Okay. Stephanie Kiffelwood, you, you of course, as I mentioned, are, 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 the, are, are planning on, or you are, you are in the middle of a campaign to become the next Speaker of the House. Why did you decide to do this, and don't you feel pretty lonely? <laughs> well, first, I want to just say thank you to Laura and Lynn. It's an honor to be here today, and I, I appreciate the invitation. But um, I guess what, what my decision was, uh, it's fundamental. I, I served in the United States Marine Corps, and we hold um, you know, a high standard of, of ethics and accountability, and uh, not everybody can be a Marine. And when I um, saw the behavior in July, I sent a letter for him to step down, and uh, then he, he issued a statement that he would not. And then I just thought that, um, you know, uh, who's going who's gonna to go up against him? And, and I'm a United States Marine, so, and, uh, you know, why not me? I, I have a, a impeccable resume. I was a registered financial advisor. I've been working on this budget for eight years in the state legislature. I'm on the budget committee, uh, the budget working group, and I have a master's degree in public administration. And so I had in, in, you know, a, a thought of, of, 
of, I am a highly qualified woman. I, I'm not just, uh, as, as was mentioned before, I have been judged on just my face and my looks and, and not really given the credit for who I am. And I said, why not me, a highly educated, highly credentialed United States Marine Corps veteran, uh, step up because the state of Illinois is failing. As, as Comptroller Mendoza said, there's been Democrats and Republicans on both sides uh, and we have huge issues. So I'm a financial person, okay. I'm, a, I'm a very analytical person, and I think the state of Illinois needs somebody like me to restore the trust and integrity in the office of the Speaker of the House. I want to jump in here, if I may, because all I know is how to count, and I know how to count to 60. And so, uh, and also, by the way, for all our viewers, uh, Stephanie Kivwood is from Oswego, Tom Demers from Dixon. We have so much of a focus sometimes on Chicago area lawmakers. It's good to have some of the other members of the State House with us tonight. As you see, everyone, two ambitious people. They don't make it, uh, you know, so I would expect to see both of them uh, be part of the bench, no matter what happens. Demer and Kipowitz, remember, you saw them here first and at the table. But here's the thing. Stephanie, thank you for your service. We don't have a lot of people who have served in the military in the General Assembly. So I do thank you for that. And just for a quick, 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 where were you, uh, where were you stationed? What's your military specialty? And when you're in uh, so, so I was an administration and logistics specialty. I served yeah. between 1990 and 1994 when women were prohibited from doing a lot of jobs in the military that I, I gotta be honest with you, Lynn, I'm a little jealous because these women today in the military are just rock stars. Uh, so I was regulated to admin uh, based on my gender and I was stationed in Camp Pendleton, California for three years and overseas in uh, Okinawa, Japan for a year. Wow, okay, so now let me get back to 60. Yes. Jim Durkin can't get to 60, he's the Republican <laughs> leader, so Tom? Unless you figure out a way to do it, you're not going to have a, you know, all the discontent. <laughs> you have 19 members who have said they don't want Mike Madigan. Correct. Well, so here's how I see it, and I want your analysis. Stephanie, either you have two questions. Either tell me how you're going to get to 60. Otherwise, your resume, I don't care. It's great. You're a great woman. Marines, that's great. But you, the only thing that counts in, in the House of Representatives, I'm in Washington, that's what I cover. You know, we have a saying, just tell me how you get to 219. That's what you need to pass something in the House. In the Senate, how do you get to 60? So how do you get to 60? And then I have a follow-up question and I'll toss it back to Laura. Well, the, there's many paths to get to 60. And right now there's 19 reps, like you said, that are absolutely... You. They're not necessarily for you. They're just not for Mike. So tell I, me. I, I believe, and I've talked to many, men, I believe if it comes down to Michael Madigan or myself, that, that I would get their support. Uh, but at the other end of the screen, Michael Madigan doesn't have 60 either. So the question is, how does he get to 60 as well? Because you have 19 individuals that sent a statement that said, we are not voting for Mike Madigan. So then we have to work just like any campaign. And I'm on the phone all the time talking to members and talking to members about their vision for a new house, a house that pays attention to the people of Illinois and a house that really wants to have good right. policies. Now, th that doesn't tell me how you get to 60, meaning you could talk. Well, you know, and, and, and do how, how many votes do you have at the moment, Stephanie? Could you tell us how many at, you have in hand right now? At the point right now, I've talked to many members and you have 19, if it comes down to me and Michael Madigan, we the, the group will you know, vote my way because they're not voting for Michael Madigan. Okay, now, but, but it's probably not going. That's probably not going to be the case. There's a lot there. There's there's a lot of uh, speculation out there. There are a number of other folks, particularly members of the Black Caucus, who may have done some kind of a side deal with Mike Madigan in order to get their initial support. No, there are other folks that you're going to be you probably competing with for those. Wait, folks. Laura Washington, you have hit on what's going to happen here, and, and Stephanie. I mean, it, so. The members of the Black Caucus right now are with Madigan, right. but that's for one ballot, maybe two. It seems to me the next Speaker of the House, according to Professor Laura Washington here, who just saw the future, will be a member of the Black Caucus because Mike can't put it together. I'm giving you, I want to give you the benefit of the doubt that the calls that maybe you could, but 
just look at this. Why would a member of the Black Caucus deal away the speakership just to get another place in leadership when one of their own can be speaker? Isn't that what's going to happen? Tom Demmer, what do you think? Well, you know, the Black Caucus uh, took a vote and chose to endorse um, Speaker Madigan for another term. That That's, that's, uh, that's, that's the only that's concrete that. action we've seen behind uh, for support of Speaker Madigan so far. That, 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 so, uh, they it, Tom, they do it for one ballot, maybe two. They, they did their thing. It, you know, they, if Mike can't make it to 60, you know, they can only do so much. How many members of the Black Caucus are there? I think it's like 22 or something like that. And, and how many overlap with the 19? No, oh, there's oh, just one, right. And one. There we go. We're almost <laughs> there. But you see my point, Stephanie, Tom, and Laura, why just get a few crumbs when you could get the loaf? You, Lynn, Lynn, I agree with you. And uh, myself and the others in my group would want a robust election because not, Michael Megan doesn't have 60. And we're asking this question too, is why aren't more people coming forward? And, and I myself, I, I like competitive elections. I would like to have an exchange of ideas. I would like to have people who want to run for this race to do it as why as, so why aren't why are more people coming forward i have no idea they're afraid, I, I they're no, afraid. I, I guess so i'm not afraid i'm standing right here and as representative demmer said uh the black caucus had an opportunity to get behind one of their own they chose not to and they chose to endorse mike manigan so this is ever fluid laura lynn this is exactly what you're explaining this is ever fluid if michael madigan gets the message he doesn't have 60 because our group signed on and said, we are not voting for him. And he chooses to retire. Then it is a whole different ball game, Lynn and Laura, and it is a, a different uh, scenario. But right now we are sitting at, I am the only one. Nobody from the Black Caucus has come forward. Right. Nobody from any caucus. And to be quite honest, the Black Caucus had a forum and they put out any and all candidates interested uh, to all 118 members. And the only other person who showed up is me. And, and that, that says something. No, you're not out. I'm not trying to put anyone in or out. Uh, I'm just seeing, Laura had the vision that I'm now <laughs> writing a little bit on here, that there I could see how an end game could be. And it takes into account, it, you know, Tom and Stephanie, that you, you as Tom talked about, the both of you have talked about the Pledge of the Black Caucus. You keep your word. Your word is your bond in politics. That's... That's the currency. You vote for Mike once, you vote for him twice. Of course, if he just retires or if some worse news about these scandals come out between now and when is the vote for speaker? The third, the fourth? When it's the 13th. No, 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 no. Oh, 13th. no, no I'm confusing that with uh, Washington, D.C. You're talking Georgia. You're talking of, you're thinking of Georgia. No, but also I think right. <laughs> oh, by the way, a little bit of quick news. Uh, we just got word tonight that Nancy Pelosi appointed uh, Congresswoman Lauren Underwood to the Appropriations Committee. So now we have three Illinoisans on the committee, Mike Quigley, Shari Bustos, and Lauren Underwood. So that- That is know, interesting. So so I'd like to, I'd like to come back to Representative Demmer and the, what, what is the Republican strategy in all this? Is it, is, it, is it possible to elect one of your own as speaker given the, some of the fracturing that's going on in the, in the Democrat, on the Democratic side? And is there a strategy there? Well, look, each uh, each election cycle, we as a Republican caucus uh, nominate someone to, to serve as speaker. Uh, that person uh, typically becomes then our, our the minority leader. So we did that same process again this year. Uh, we're nominating Jim Durkin to be speaker of the House. Uh, we understand, though, that, you know, the Democrats have a majority in the House and that these um, deals that are being cut are likely going to be deals that are cut within the Democratic caucus uh, and not uh, not necessarily have uh, involvement of Republicans. We're pushing for, you know, both a Speaker of the House with moral and ethical standards, but also a Speaker of the House who shares, um, you know, some of the political vision that each of us elected from our districts come to Springfield to advocate for. And what that would be what? What is your political vision? Well, you know, the first thing, and this is very relevant with the news we've seen recent days, is uh, bring back some fiscal responsibility and some sanity to the, to the state's uh, problems that, you know, the comptroller was on earlier talking about how COVID has uh, reduced our revenues by a couple billion dollars. Our deficit is much more than that. You know, our, our deficit existed uh, before COVID and it continues to exist now. 
um, there was a, a people really uh, burying their heads in the sand when the Democratic legislature passed a budget that was five billion dollars out of balance in May. The governor buried his head in the sand when he signed that budget into law, and here we are six months later realizing that a magical congressional um, uh, bailout is not coming and that voters soundly rejected a massive tax increase. So we're dealing with the, the same reality that we had in May. It's just now others are waking up to it. Well, with the a package, of, well, this is, I don't know, we only have a few minutes left. I don't know if I want to go into all these cuts that the governor is proposing. So let me put that aside because we could spend another whole show on that. I just want to ask you guys, in the, with the incoming Biden administration, Congressman Tom, the Congressman Tom Demmer, Rep, I just got to lose this Congressman thing here. Uh, Representative Demmer, can you just tell us, do you accept that Joe Biden will be the president come January 20th? Can we? I, I do. The Electoral College met in, uh, across the country. We were, I was actually in Springfield for the investigative committee on Monday and the Electoral College is meeting there. And uh, the uh, president-elect Biden has won more than 270 electoral votes. And so that's, uh, that's the end of the story. Well, actually, in a way, though, it's not because Republican President Trump is encouraging election deniers, and he's one of the top ones. How do we get past this, Tom? I, I think we need to understand that you know, if there are substantiated allegations of fraud, those need to be investigated. But we can't simply cast a pall over uh, elections all across the country because people don't like the outcomes of those. We've had cases that have made it their way to the Supreme Court. Even Trump appointees on the Supreme Court um, have dismissed those cases or refused to hear those cases. Uh, we need to try to establish a better opportunity for us to respect the political differences that we have, uh, understand the diversity of the states and the, the, the nation that we inhabit, and look for common ground, look for some level of decency in each other and reach beyond what can be a very polarizing world if you live in those political bubbles of social media sometimes. Well, it's more than just polarizing. It seems to, uh, threatening our, our democracy at this. But Laura, I know we're coming uh, to a close. I have a quick question, unless you had one to close out this well, segment on Madigan. Go, go right ahead, Lynn. Okay. Uh, with the Madigan uh, situation, do you envision any scenario where you just will be frozen in hundreds of votes? As uh, Remember in uh, the, uh, when there is once more than 100 votes for a Senate president, but it was open? Or do you think, he, you know, first Stephanie and then Tom, do you think this will be resolved within a few days once, once the votes start? Well, Lynn, um, that is a question that our group of 19 have talked about, and we are committed to doing all 100 votes to stand up for the people of Illinois and to get a new Speaker of the House. Uh, I, I would hope that um, the Speaker will realize that he does not have the 60 votes, that he's jeopardizing the state of Illinois, and that we need to transition and we need to start a new day in Illinois. And I think the people of Illinois want a new speaker. And I think we need to start embracing that there are other ways to do things than the one way Illinois has been stuck on for the last 40 years. Okay, and so Tom, it looks like the Democrats could just paralyze the House uh, until they get this uh, speaker picked. How damaging will that be? Quickly though, but quickly. Well, yeah, it's, you know, we're gonna have some very, very big issues to tackle, not, not just in responding to the, the public health pandemic that we're in the midst of, uh, but also dealing with the financial problems that are right at our doorstep. Uh, I like uh, to be a student of, of Illinois history. And like you said, there have been a couple of times where we've gone through, you know, over 100 votes to elect a presiding officer. That could be the case again if the speaker chooses to double down and, and, uh, and not to give up the, the gavel without a fight. Um, but we have very important issues that the House and the Senate need to be able to address. And we can't just get caught in a Democratic political fight. Uh, and put aside those important issues. Okay, well, we will see. Well, Lynn, I would, I would like to just give our, our uh, Attorney, Attorney General one, one shot at this one too, because you're a former member of the state Senate yourself. What, mm -hmm. what do you, what do you, do you think we're gonna be in a, in a mid, in the midst of a endless balance next month? Or how, how, how do you see this playing out? I, 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 you know, I wish I could predict what I can share with you, Laura, I, I pray not because you know, I. Uh, in addition to the issues that uh, Representative Demmer uh, uh, identify, 
I met with my legislative team today to talk about the things that we need to do policy wise. And, and it, it would be a, a travesty to not be able to face all of these issues, the issues of social justice that we were talking about earlier. There are some legislative things that would need to be accomplished attached to that, as well as a broad range of issues dealing with protecting consumers and, 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 and so on. We can't have this paralyze uh, the, our state uh, doing the right thing w with regards to policy, with regards to appropriations, of, and with regards to dealing with the fiscal crisis that, that's on the table. It's time to get some business done. Exactly. That's a good place to end us, Lynn. You're going to take us out? I will. We're at a very dramatic crossroads right now in our state and national government. So thank you, Attorney General Karami Raul. Thank you, Comptroller Susanna Mendoza was with us. Representative Tom Demmer, Republican. Democrat Stephanie Kifferwit, who is the only candidate so far to replace Mike Madigan. So we've had a great show. Of course, we've had Professor Michael Eric Dyson with us for a segment two, talking about race and the incoming Biden administration. So thank you all our guests. But now I wanna to talk to you, our viewers. The Chicago Sun-Times local paper, local journalism, original reporting. We're here to tell you about you and your community. We have multiple offers I wanna sell you tonight on our digital offerings to bring you whatever you want. I wanna, you're looking right now at the e-paper. I love the e-paper. I get up in the morning, I roll over, get my laptop fired up. And because I'm in Washington, I read the e-paper, I read it all the time. It's a great product, it looks just like the real Sun-Times. You could have it for only $2.49 a month. You could go to suntimes.com slash subscribe. We also want you to have a print subscription too, but I know we're talking to a national audience right now. So local journalism cannot survive without people helping us and how do you help us? Just buy a subscription, $2.49 a month. It's a stocking stuffer. It's a wedding gift, a Hanukkah gift, bar mitzvah gift, christening, <laughs> you name it. It's a great gift. Hope you could do it. And now I hope all our viewers on behalf of Laura and I have a great holiday next week. We'll be coming back to you next month to talk about the incoming Biden presidency just before the inauguration. See you then. Thanks for joining us. Happy holidays. <laughs> <laughs>